saber class, the German, German saber presentation. Um, all right, so, uh, um, uh, all right, well, uh, Patrick, I don't know if you want to do, uh, yeah, do an intro uh, I'll, uh, I'll spend a, a minute or two uh, introducing you, and then, um, do you have slides, Max, or are you just going to talk? Uh, which, which, which would you, which would yeah. you prefer? Yes, I have slides, yes. Okay. Did you want to um you want to take a second just to see if the sharing screen works all right? Sure. And and then I can I can bloviate a little bit while you while you while you do that. So Okay. All right. Um thank you for joining us. Uh, today it's a little after 12 noon on a Saturday. Uh, my name is Patrick Bratton. I'm the head instructor of Sala de la Spada Historical Fencing, which is a small uh, fencing school in South Central Pennsylvania. Earlier this year, I started a lecture series um, on sort of history and theory of different uh, fencing systems. Given the concentration of my own school on the Italian tradition, I've tended to emphasize that. Um, but we also break out into other uh, traditions as well that are related. We've had a lecture a few weeks ago by Ma Maestro Tan Pue on the Montante, the Mediterranean Greatsword, and today we're going to have Max talk about French saber. And again, kind of the goal of the lecture series is to connect a lot people to a larger community dealing with history, fencing, uh, recreation. Um, oftentimes um, we're siloed, whether you're sort of, uh, you know, HEMA, SCA, Olympic fencing, um, historical reenactment, these sorts of things. So my goal is to try and bring people together and bridge, uh, sort of build bridges between communities and also to get a greater attention, particularly to sort of non-English language traditions. It's very easy uh, in the HEMA verse to sort of be sort of read texts that are originally in English. It's sometimes more challenging um, with French, Italian, and, and so on. So one of my goals of the lecture series is to bring a lot of these non-English language traditions uh, to a sort of Anglo-Saxon audience. We are very uh, blessed today to have Maxime Chouinard uh, talking with us. And Maxime is a very interesting fellow. He's very much a, a Renaissance man. Um, he has been a practitioner of martial arts since the mid-1990s in karate, kenjutsu, and a variety of other systems, including, I believe, the kenjutsu of Miyamoto Musashi. Um, he's also a scholar and practitioner of Irish stick and the Antrim Bada uh, tradition. He went over to Ireland and learned that. And he's also been very active in reconstructing sort of the history of French uh, fencing and French saber. And he's also a trained uh, museum professional as well. Um, so he's, again, almost anything you can kind of ask Mass. Max, you can ask Max. So today, I'd like him to be talking about French Sabre. Um, I'm going to be kind of busy letting people in. We always have a whole bunch of people who come in late, so if I'm a little bit distracted, but I'll turn it over without further ado to you, Max. Great. Thanks you. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, so, hi, everyone. Uh, and uh, again, thanks, Patrick, for the wonderful introduction. Um, so, uh, I, I know... Uh, I think I know quite a lot about uh, French saber, but uh, you know I'm not not that good in other things. Uh, uh, if you ask me to uh, fix your electric cables, uh, uh, I have just no idea how that works. So uh, there, you know, uh, there are things I'm I'm not so good at. Um, and so today we're going to be talking about the origins and development of French saber, as the uh, title indicates. Um, so, as Patrick was mentioning, I've been uh, I've been studying HEMA uh, for uh, well since about 2002, and uh, from the get-go, I've been really interested in um, uh, French sources, mostly from the 18th, 19th century, and uh, I would say that I, I'm I'm mostly working from Saber, Lacan, Baton. Uh, those are really my my three main things. Uh, I, I do a little bit of um, uh, foil. I do a little bit of, uh, um, well, I would say I dabble in savat. I'm not not really, uh, wouldn't call myself really uh, much of a savatar, but um, I, I, I I do a, a little bit of that. But this is, uh, Sabre is really one of my main things. And um, so I've been, uh, I've been researching this ever since. And uh if you uh, ever want to know more about uh, some of my research, I invite you to visit my blog, which is called uh, HEMA Misfits. Um, I don't do longsword um, as well. So this is uh, this is kind of a, a blog I started a couple of years ago now, and uh, I publish some, some of the research I do in there because uh, I'm just too... Uh, uh, no, I, I 
I am I too lazy to publish any books or publish articles and journals or stuff like that. I just uh, not, I, I, I'm not uh, I'm not really uh, really good at that. So I hope uh, hope you enjoy some of the articles I, I post there. So coming back to our subject, so French saber. So what exactly are we going to talk about today, right? So French saber is uh, a big world, um, and but it is one that is not very well, uh, very well known, unfortunately. And that's too bad because I think this is probably one of the most influential, along with well, the whole French school with foil, and small sword, and however you want to call it. Um, I think this uh, this style of saber fencing truly um, truly influence fencing uh, all over the world, really, uh, but uh, especially, of course, in uh, in Europe and uh, in North America. So we're just going to be looking at exactly what's a saber for the French. So you're going to see during my presentation sometimes that I talk about sabers that. Uh, have straight blades, and this this has been quite a uh, back and back and forth uh, discussion with a lot of people over the years. And uh, why do uh, why in French sources uh, do we see uh, sabers uh, that have uh, straight blades? Why do we see um, even in uh, uh, even in um, uh, regulations for the army we see swords with straight blades are called saber and in the english language of course uh this is uh apparently kind of a sin uh sabers are curved and swords are straight that's it uh so it's a little bit more complex in the french language so we're gonna go back a little bit to first uses of the word saber to uh see exactly what we mean by this so here I've included a little figure from the Mémoire d'Artillerie by the uh, Sieur Suriré de Saint-Rémy, quite a tongue twister, that name, uh, published in 1697. So the word saber pretty much appears in France in the 17th century, uh, but it's really more by the late 17th century that it really enters the, um, the common uh, language. And this is one of the first really explanations that we see of the uh, of the the word, or at least use it with images. And uh, so you can see here in this image, he uh, shows us a different swords, different weapons that are used by um, French soldiers. And there is a uh, there's a couple of sabers, and there's a sword. Now the the one on the left is uh, an an epi, so a sword. Uh, number A, or letter A, rather. And when you move to uh, K and L, you have sable de cavalier à deux tranchants, and then you have uh, uh, sable ou lame courbe à dos. So you have a straight saber, and then you have a curved saber, and you have a, a saber with two edges, and you have a saber with one edge. So what exactly is a saber for these guys, right? Um, so what you discover when you look at the sources and you try to understand where they're getting at is that they seem to consider that a saber is a cutting sword. It's, a, it's basically a broadsword. A curve or not, doesn't care. Uh, it's a saber because it's meant for cutting, mostly. Uh, and the, the sword, or the epée, is meant mostly for thrusting. So that's where the distinction comes in, uh, at least for the uh, late 17th century, early 18th century. Of course, it, it's different in other languages. Uh, people make other distinctions, and that's perfectly fine. And you know, I'm not trying to say that this is this is what people should should use. Uh, but it's a it's very interesting to see how words evolve. And I do think that uh, if uh, it will be also interesting if people made such studies or such research in the history of 
the words used in their own languages. Because I think sometimes we, we take things for granted based on the current usage of a word. But when we look back, we see that things are, are maybe a little bit different. So anyway, we'll, we'll stick to uh, French for today. But that's, that's what things were in the uh, 17th, 18th century. Now, we move a little bit further. So by the late 18th century and by the first days of the French Empire, we start to see a um, kind of a switch in how people are calling their swords and their sabers. And it starts to be a lot more precise. And when I started to, again, dig into this, it, it was very confusing again because... Uh, was, it was very hard at the beginning to understand what exactly was the limit between a saber and a sword, all right, or an epée, because again, uh, they could have straight or curved blades and didn't seem like there was much of a difference there. But again, when you look at the sources and you put them next to each other, you realize that uh, there's there's some commonalities that starts to emerge, and it seems that by the the turn of the 19th century, people start to call sabers weapons that are that have a saber hilt. Uh, and what I mean by this is if you look at on the left side, you see an epée and you see a saber. So this is a 1816 pattern epée and you have a uh, 1829 pattern saber for uh, mounted artillery. And so those are very uh, good examples of both. So the, the the main difference I could find in looking at all these sources is that the French seem to consider that a saber is a saber when the pommel makes um, is uh, basically is part of the grip. You know, the, the the pommel cap basically is not very much differentiated from the grip itself, right? So when you look at the saber and see that the pommel just forms a continuation of that grip. And in the case of the epée, the pommel really stands out from the grip. And that seems to be where they drew the line. Of course, there's exceptions and uh, you, you'll see them in, uh, in, in French sources, but this, this seems to be pretty much what um, govern the definition for the 19th century, at least, and um, let's say pr probably up to today as well. Uh, and beyond that, they also separated sabers by types. And you see here, there's three different kinds of uh, saber blades that I was able to uh, identify uh, in different sources again. Uh, so you have the, the bancal, demi-bancal, and the lat. And I know it's written like latte, but it's pronounced differently. Trust me. Uh, so the uh, bancal is basically a, a strongly curved saber, like the 1829 we have here. So bancal uh, in French uh, means basically crooked, uh, right? It's, it's, it comes mostly from furniture making, interestingly. Uh, it was used to refer to curved um, curved legs on, um, on chairs or on tables. And so uh, this is, uh, it's, it's very interesting that they start using this for weapons, but the French army has kind of a tradition of calling their, their swords by, by kind of everyday item names, right? So you have the short saber for the infantry is called a briquet, a lighter, not a, not a briquette, by the way. Uh, and uh, when you go to the lat at the bottom here, uh, a lat is basically kind of a uh, plank of wood. And uh, so again, they, they decided to use this kind of common day item to describe their, their saber. Uh, and you'll have this also with the cuillère à peau, so the um, uh, uh, soup spoon, yes, uh, which uh, they used to call their um, uh, uh, naval cutlass, and also you have the kupshu, uh, which is sometimes translated as cabbage cutter uh, for their, uh, their gladius for the uh, artillery. Now, uh, kupshu is uh, usually in French we use it 
writer uh, to call the um, straight razor. Uh, so that might be where the term actually comes from. But coming back to those different blades, uh, so you see, uh, I was saying you have the bancal, very curved saber. You have the demi bancal, so a saber that's curved, but you know, reasonably so, let's say, uh, like the 1822 we have here. And then you have the lat, which is a straight saber, right? So um, that's mainly the three types of uh, saber blades that uh, you'll encounter in, in those sources. Right, so now we've defined, we've uh, established a little bit what we're gonna be talking about. Uh, let's look at the fencing. So um, before we move to saber, I just wanna explain a little bit what was going on before this weapon or this type of fencing started appearing. So before saber, you of course have fencing in France and you have of course have hat and truss fencing going on. Uh, and this is one of the first uh, manuals that's uh, really defined as a, uh, as a French uh, fencing treatise. And this is Henri de Saint-Dizier who published in 1573. Uh, very interesting treatise, uh, very uh, kind of very short, and at least uh, if, uh, if you consider the uh, treatises of the time, uh, but uh, pretty complex also to 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 learn and to understand. Uh, so uh, now, what is interesting really about Didier is um, that he's uh, he's really appearing at an interesting time in French fencing history. Uh, so in 1573, it's been about you know, a couple of years, not, not even 10 years, that the Corporation des Maîtres d'Armes de Paris has existed. So what is the Corporation des Maîtres d'Armes de Paris? This is basically the uh, French Fencing Master Guild. Uh, and it was established by royal decree in 15, 16, uh, 1567, and um, uh, there were there were other decrees later on. And you see here, this is uh, Louis the the fourteenth on a uh, uh, coin made uh, to uh, to commemorate one of those. Uh, I think it was the uh, uh, coat of arms of the uh, corporation that was created in 1706, uh, but. Uh, you know, this is uh, this is really an interesting era for French fencing because when the corporation starts in 1567, they also institute rules about who could teach not only in Paris but in the whole kingdom, at least in theory. Because uh, if you wanted to become a French uh, master, uh, you had to come to Paris to study with a French master. Um, and they, they fix the um, period to become a prévôt, so an apprentice, to six years, and then two years of study before you undergo your prize, uh, your, your game of prize, your, your jeu de prix. So they, they had about, uh, they had about six the masters using the single sword, sword and dagger, two-handed sword, the albert, and the staff, or the baton de goût. And these rules are not always followed, and there's many ways to allow for exceptions, uh, namely if the king really likes you or if you're um, teaching in a uh, military academy, and, uh, the, and some, some masters don't even care at all. Uh, in Dijon, for example, from what I understand, there's very few or even any masters that were established there that uh, went to study in Paris. Uh, but it, it was in theory, that was the, the rules. And so the, the reasons why they had the, all these different weapons as well was to bar entry to foreign fencing masters. Well, at least that's what we believe they, they did that for. Because uh, by the late 16th century, all these weapons are not necessarily known by all, um, mostly by Italian fencing masters, right? Because by this time period, they're, they're the big competitors to French fencing masters. You know, everybody wants to learn from, from the Italians. And so by fixing these rules, uh, and they say, uh, oh, well, you know, you gotta spend some time uh, uh, learning in Paris if you wanna teach in France. Uh, 
and um, you know you can pass your exam right now but uh, by the way you gotta you gotta do an assault with uh, two-handed sword Albert staff you know you know those things and maybe have quite a few uh, fencing masters from other countries that uh, never touch uh, some of the, these weapons uh, so that that was one of the ways for them to maintain kind of their monopoly and so they they it's a sign that they've become um, they become confident enough to establish those things, right? Uh, because France, up until that time, you know, there were always fencing masters around. But uh, when you wanted to learn fencing, you went to Italy, you went to Germany. Uh, French was kind of, you know, uh, yeah, there's there's fencing there, but whatever. So now, uh, also, there's a shift in mentality around that time around fencing. And uh, this is here, Michel de Montaigne, really interesting uh, uh, French author, uh, wrote about lots of different things, but uh, he, um, in his uh, writings, he mentions a few interesting things about uh, fencing. And I think one of the most interesting thing he says is the way that when he, or when he was young in his father days, how French uh, uh, nobles, perceived fencing. And so he's, he tells us, à mon enfance, la noblesse fuit la réputation de bon escrimeur comme injurieuse et se déroboit pour l'apprendre comme métier de subtilité dérogeant à la vraie et naïve vertu. So what he's saying there is, when I was a kid, the nobility really, um, uh, they, uh, they avoided the reputation of a good fencer uh, they saw this as an insult, and when they wanted to learn fencing, they would do it in secret, and uh, the uh, uh, because for them this was a trade. Uh, this was this was kind of a, uh, a coward's uh, trade, and it uh, it uh, diverted you from the true virtue, which was courage. So interesting thing that he says there, and even more interesting because. Montaigne is an avid fencer, and we 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 know it from his writings. He goes to Italy to learn fencing from some really famous masters, and even some that published uh, manuals that uh, we uh, we still study today. And he goes to Germany. He, he, he uh, observes fencing there as well, and so. But he, he still have this very strong opinion about fencing. He says it's uh, you know it's uh, it's not useful in wartime. It's uh, it, it um, cultivates um, anger, um, pushes you to break the law, uh, and it doesn't develop courage, you know. And what he means there is, uh, I think, the the the, the under, under text of what the Montaigne is saying here is that nobles are not made; nobles are born. Right, they're uh, they're given their uh, their skills and uh, their uh, their capabilities by God, and so if you have to go see a fencing master to become a good warrior, then what kind of noble are you? You know, you're not really any better than those bourgeois or those uh, peasants, right? They, they they can also learn fencing. So you know what really uh, what really sets you out from all the commoners is your courage, you know, your virtue. And so it's interesting to see that this, this what this old mentality was and how it's changing in Maltang days. And people are are kind of moving away from, from this, this belief. But still, all throughout the old regime, people uh, of noble upbringing will continue to learn fencing in private lessons and away from public eye because you had to maintain um, uh, the, the process of uh, ennoblement had to be kept away from uh, the public eye you know, it was kind of it was seen as a little bit uh, vulgar to uh, showcase your skills in, in fencing that way um, so moving on right so we now we enter the 17th century, and of course, the uh, I'm not really teaching you anything. I think at this point that the early 17th century is really the era of 
the uh, Italian fencer of the rapier, right? So uh, really the uh, uh, the rapier, as we commonly understand it, uh, really is uh, is ruling the, the fencing world. And um, it's, I would say this is a, uh, one of the basics of French sabers comes from this, and it's using the guard as a shield, right? Um, so not only is, uh, you know, when people start to get interested in saber, they usually look at the saber guard and say, oh, it's great, it protects your hand. And uh, if you've done a little bit of, of saber, I think at some point you realize that it's, it's more than that. Uh, the guard is not just there to protect your hand, does that pretty well, and that's great, but it's also used kind of as a buckler sort, right? It uh, closes the line towards your, your arm, closes the line towards your body. So uh, because of this, there's kind of this different style of uh, fencing that appears as well. And, um, you know, the... Um, when people discuss why complex handguards took so long to appear, you know, and, and we always say, oh, it's because gauntlets disappear, it's because uh, shields disappear. That's where people started to need uh, um, uh, complex hills. But I'm not not quite sure that this is the case. I think that um, really complex guard appear not quite as a compensation for less armor but rather the development of early complex guards made people realize that they could now use shorter movements when cutting. Um, so I'm gonna, just gonna use something else as an example. So as uh, Patrick was saying uh, earlier on, I, I not only study and teach uh, Sabre, but I also uh, probably more so uh, these days, they teach uh, stick fighting. Uh, for example, Irish stick fighting, and I also, of course, do uh, French Lacan, French Baton, and learn a couple of different Bojutsu and Kenjutsu styles. And um, one major difference that I observe in a lot of these styles is that the absence of a complex guard forces you to change how you strike, right? Because if I, for example, if I old my hand in front of you like this, and it's unprotected, you're probably gonna be tempted to strike it, right? If you're if you're good enough uh, fencer. And uh, so I'm gonna have, when I when I strike you, or in a defense, when, I'm, when I move my weapon around, I'm gonna have to start moving it a lot more than usual, right? Um, because I wanna protect that hand. If I start to do moulinet like we do in Sabre, where I just, turn from the wrist and my hand and my arm stays, stays right in front like this, it's gonna become very quickly obvious to you that you only need to wait for the right moment to snipe my hand, right? So I'm gonna have to move it around. But when you start to see these complex hilts appear, I think this is when people start to realize, hey, we can actually now keep our hands in front and we don't have to worry so much about getting that hand cut when um, when we uh, when we attack, right? So uh, I think that that was uh, this is a very important uh, evolution in the um, development of saber fencing. And you see others like Fabrice, for example, you know, who tells you that you can use different types of cuts with the rapier. You, you know, you can cut the elbow. You can whole arm, but he says, you know, the best kind of cut comes from the wrist. And this is the, this idea that that's going to get more common and common. Of course, you know, uh, we can, we can debate if that's really the best way to cut. Uh, and I'm sure people have uh, opinions about this, but that's, uh, it, it really starts to become the, the uh, mainstream opinions, at least among published uh, fencing authors of the time. Um, so now, by the second half of the 17th century, uh, the French school really starts to pick up steam. And they uh, become more and more influ influential, not just in France, interestingly, but uh, also 
um, in other countries because France is becoming a major military and cultural player at the time. It was always kind of a, a, a big, uh, uh, big power uh, in, in Europe, but really by the mid 17th century, it's uh, it's really imposing itself as a uh, uh, probably the the the, uh, the most uh, powerful nation in in Europe and. French Masters starts to publish more and more at that point. And the small sword starts to also impo impose itself as the gentleman weapon of choice. And so the um, the first one I want to present here is Philibert de la Touche. You're probably gonna wonder why is he presenting us a uh, one of the, these uh, uh, small sword guys. You know, we, we wanna we wanna talk about saber today. Um, so but Hear me out. So, uh, Philibert de la Touche, or Philibert Morin, actually, by his real name. So, de la Touche is kind of a, a play on words. Uh, so, de la ta touch, right? So, like fencing. Um, was fencing master to the Queen's pages and the Duke of Orleans. And his treatise is mostly about point or trust fencing. But he dedicates a section to what he calls the estramason, or cuts. So estramason is a word used at this point to designate the sweet spot or the center of percussion in a, uh, of a blade, uh, at least in, in, in French fencing. And according to De La Touche, it is the part you should use to cut with, but it also it's also a word which describes a cutting action itself. So when you're using, when you're doing the, the estramason, when you're um, you're playing the estramason, it's uh, you're 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 doing cut fencing. And um, the vocabulary he uses in his uh, chapter on Estramason is very unusual. But if you are used to, uh, very unusual at least if you're used to later Sabre manuals, but it's very similar to earlier works such as Saint Didier and Colombon, for example. So De La Touche divides his cuts into four different ones. He's got the Faux Montant, so rising cuts, Revers, back end, descendant, descending, and main droit, forehand. And all the cuts are made from the wrist and either with a, what he calls a tie simple or a tie owned. So either a half or a full rotation of the blade. All of them are done with draw cuts, which I think is uh, very interesting for uh, the time period because uh, we usually think that it comes much later on. Uh, so he tells us that it's pretty much the same as his point or uh, small sword section. In this way, we could say that De La Touche falls pretty much in what will come to be called contrepoint. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on in the presentation. But he also has a very interesting section on cavalry sword. And if you're interested in that kind of thing, uh, in the, the horsey hema, I, um, I encourage you to, to look at his treatise. Uh, it's a pretty short, but it gives some very interesting uh, techniques in there. Um, including, like a, as you see here, uh, draw cuts used to uh, cut your opponent's head off. Um, so De La Pointe is the last, really, uh, sorry, De La Touche is the last point author to talk about the Estramason, but he's also the first one to really set the foundation for what, uh, for what will become French counterpoint or saber. So he presents the same engaging guards that will be used for the next two centuries, him, second, tierce, and quarte. And the body is held, of course, sideways. It's um, the, the weight is on back foot, and the cuts are centered on the wrist and using very uh, opposition fairies. Right? So it starts to be very similar to what we'll see for the uh, the following centuries. Um, now, talking about the following centuries. Uh, the 18th century is really a desert in terms of cut fencing in France, um, fortunately for us. So as I explained earlier, we have few manuals that really discuss saber fencing. Now, why is that? So we could probably be uh, of the same opinion as many fencing authors, like Martin, for example, I'll, I'll talk about him in a minute, uh, who says that the art of um, espadon or cut fencing is not really practiced in France. But but then it's a very curious opinion because when you, you read other sources, uh, they, they do teach it and they do talk about it, 
and we know that it's thought. So, uh, and even sometimes in some Parisian cells, uh, but most of them seems to be in the military. I think that's a very important uh, distinction because we start to hear about different types of fencing masters in the 18th century, and we have uh, maître d'escrime, so fencing masters, and we have also maître d'espadon, so espadon masters. And uh, the there really seems to be a distinction at this point. And it sounds like there is really a culture of saber fencing in the military that is not quite as reflected in the 18th century in the Corporation des Maîtres d'Armes. So there's also a shift in fencing vocabulary at that time. So I, I told you about uh, De La Touche and the, um, uh, the vocabulary he uses, which is very uh, old fashioned for the time. Uh, but afterwards, it changes completely. So Fomentin, Ravel, this has all disappeared. Instead, we, we read of coup de tête, de figure, de flanc, de manchette, de jarret. So head cuts, face cuts, flank cuts, uh, um, forearm cuts, or um, tie cuts. And yet, this evolution does not seem to come from any manual at the time, because uh, there's... Uh, uh, it's mentioned, but there's there's not a single manual that sets the table for this. So what it tells me is that, again, there's this unpublished culture of saber fencing in France, and it's, um, it, it's developing its own thing without what's happening in the published uh, fencing manuals of the Parisian fencing masters, who are... Uh, sometimes completely oblivious to what's going on uh, with the, uh, the Espadon, for example. So um, now there, there is some, um, some um, uh, meaning uh, in, in those two worlds, right? So there is, uh, uh, it doesn't seem, it doesn't mean that they don't communicate and quite the contrary because many military men, we know, we know by their, their memoirs, for example, will, become fencing masters and will transit by the Parisian academies to, to perfect their skills and also to teach there sometimes, even during their, their military service. So uh, again, it's uh, it, it just seems that these people don't gravitate around authors like Martin with very no, little knowledge of this world, apparently. Uh, but this is the start of the Espadonneur and the Contrepointe. So, in the 18th century, French fencing is mutating in another way again. So it, there, the focus now is on specific weapons, such as was the case in the uh, days of saint Dizier. But um, it's, uh, it's now switched to a more general kind of uh, weapon, if you will. So the first two that we see most of the time are point and espadon. So point is very simple. It's the style that focuses on using only thrust. So it's the foil, it's the small sword style, but it's not just constrained to small sword. You can learn point and use it with a cavalry saber. And uh, again, it's documented. We have, uh, uh, we know that soldiers did that. You know? So they, they learn point, they learn foil to learn how to use their cavalry saber. Sounds completely strange to us today. Uh, but th this this made sense for people back then, um, and now the um, we get to okay so we get to the um, the famous or the infamous Espadon. So I've really spent you know if uh, I spent probably a lot of time on uh, on keyboards and uh, on um, reading uh, different sources to try to make sense of this damn espadon word. So why am I so angry at this fish? Uh, so now I'm just gonna explain a quick thing. The, the word espadon has many different meanings in history and especially in the 18th century. It is what you call a two-handed sword. Uh, but by the 18th century, it's a very antiquated term. People don't really uh, use that anymore. 
It is also used to describe a broadsword, so uh, any kind of sword, saber, straight, whatever, that has a broad, uh, broad blade, and it really enters the common usage in, uh, in the 18th century, uh, and it becomes even vulgar for some people. It's, uh, uh, there's this form called espadron, with an R, and people say you should not say this, it's not, it's not correct. And you have the swordfish, which is called an espadon in French. And if you talk to French people today, so if I'm if I mention espadon, I'm doing uh, espadon fencing to uh, to my partner. Uh, this is what she's gonna imagine. Uh, so this is a an illustration that's uh, that was done by um, uh, a, a YouTuber, a French YouTuber, uh, that uh, it's um, uh, Art Français. Um, sorry, I, I could have checked before, uh, but he's, uh, it's a very good channel. Uh, I'll try to find it at the end. Uh, but uh, he had this uh, this uh, little video series about the uh, demi espadon, which I won't get into. But um, he's uh, th this is what his wife drew apparently when uh, she learned that he was uh, doing this video. Uh, so again, like French people for French people today, the word espadon is only the swordfish. There's, there's nothing else. Uh, but that wasn't the case back in the 18th and even 19th century, um, because we uh, we know that uh, there was another kind of espadon, and it was a uh, fencing style. And it's a style that uses mostly cuts. I say mostly, uh, but it's, it's really a cut-centric type of system. Think uh, if you're doing British uh, fencing, think broadsword uh, or saber. So when I started to be interested in French fencing, one of the first sources that really was coming up uh, was uh, Girard, was widely available at the time. And uh, so uh, Girard was a Marine or Naval officer. We don't know that much about the guy, but we, we know he was an officer and he was probably a fencing master. Uh, I say Marine or Naval because he only says he's a uh, officier de Marine which could mean that he was in the Navy or that he was in the Marines. And uh, it's, it's not quite clear. Um, but anyway, uh, he, he's one of those authors that talks pretty much only about point, about small sword, but he mentions to us how to beat the espadon, the espadon, the espadon with uh, a small sword. And that's where things really get interesting for us. So when you look at his treatise, and a lot of people were looking at it back in the day, and they were looking at the first few figures, and they were trying to define exactly what's an espadon. And a problem we have here is people tend to focus on the first few images where he's, he has this very straight kind of broadsword, maybe like spadroon-like weapon in his hand and say, oh, that's that's what an espadon is. That's uh, it's a broadsword or it's a spadroon, right? Sounds like spadroon, so it must be it. Uh, but then you turn a few pages later and you see that now the espadon has a curved saber. What is going on here? Right? Well, what is this? And because he never quite defines the espadon, uh, it, and very few authors, fencing authors do, it's, uh, it's, it's, it becomes very confusing for people. And so again, when I looked at the sources uh, and I looked at period dictionaries and I compared all these sources together and, and, and tried to make some sense of what they were saying, uh, there was a couple of things that I noticed is that they were referring, when they were talking about the, the fencer or the fencing itself, they use espadon or espadon. When they were talking about the weapon itself, they would talk about the saber or the epée. So there seemed to be a distinction here. And when you look at some dictionaries of the time, you also see that there seems to be this distinction in, in fencing, very special distinction. Uh, and they say espadon is this style of fencing using mostly cuts, and they use very wide parries compared to, uh, to foil or to point. And uh, yeah, it seems like this was the uh, uh, the name for the style of fencing of this arm 
is also uh, another very confusing term in, in French fencing. So now, uh, as we're talking about Girard, so most people, um, well, you know, it, sorry. Uh, so what what exactly does Espadon look like? Right? Uh, so we have these authors that don't speak too much about it, but Girard give, gives us a pretty good idea, actually, what, what it is. Um, so it's a style that's not quite as normalized as Quaint or Small Sword, apparently. Again, because probably the corporation doesn't have much of an interest in it. But they um, they use uh, apparently wrist cuts, they use elbow cuts, they use full arm moulinet, they, uh, they use even some guards that look very antiquated for the time. And this is our guy, Martin, published in 1737. And here he's showing us how to, uh, to beat an Espadana. Uh, so I guess he's encountered some, even though he says that it's not really practiced in France. But anyway, well, well maybe it was some boring uh, Espadana, who knows? Uh, but he's, uh, what he's showing us here is really interesting because it, it looks more like Bolognese side sword to me than it would 19th century saber. Uh, the Espana, he has his left leg forward. He's into this hang guard. He strikes with a passing step forward, very wide Moulinet, um, and uh, uses terrible timing <laughs> because uh, Martin manages to uh, thrust him uh, while his uh, right foot has landed way before his sword. So uh, anyway, so this is how to be the really lousy uh, but um, yeah, it, it seems from these writing that there's some, you know, there, there, there's already the idea of what will become French saber in the 19th century is already pretty established, but there are some uh, remains, I would say, of older methods in there as well. They're probably continuing to be taught in the military or with uh, even with fencing masters. Uh, for example, here again we have Girard, and uh, you know I was uh, looking at some some plates here from Paul the Sector Mayor, and this guard really reminded me of uh, this uh, this guard that Girard uh, shows us in his, his treatise. Not really used quite the same way as um, what Mayor would do, but uh, it's hard not to see kind of a resemblance here. Of what's going on? So now moving on. Uh, we get one of our first real manuals in 15, uh, uh, 1757 sorry, by um, a, an author named uh, Perina. So Juan Nicolas Perina, or perhaps we should probably call him writer Jean Nicolas Perina. Um, so Perina published this manual in uh, 1757 in Spain. That's that's going to be at the start of an interesting point here in my presentation. Most saber fencing authors, I'm talking about French saber fencing, are published outside of France. So you have to look at other countries to really get a good image of what's going on in France. Um, but so Perina published this manual, and uh, it was uh, it was made for the Naval Academy at Cadiz. Uh, so at the time, the Spanish Navy is looking to reform its methods. Uh, they are um, uh, they are they are trying to follow the French Enlightenment principles, and so they bring uh, French fencing, foil, and saber to their academy as well. And so early on, I said that Perina was uh, probably had a French name. Uh, so how do we know that? Well, first off, his last name is very French sounding. It's not not really, um, not really a typical uh, Spanish name, but it's uh, it's it's a name that you would hear in France. Uh, but also, he wrote a little word at the end of one of his manuscripts. Uh, so this is what he wrote. So he says here, and it's it's in French. Um, says uh, how he uh, made this uh, this manuscript, and with the help of uh, this this. Uh, this Senor Don Jorge Yuan. Now, if you can read French and you try to read this, it's uh, the the orthography here is horrible. Uh, this is uh, this is like 
first grader kind of orthograph. And even then, I, I think it's, it's kind of insulting for first grader. Uh, so I, I think that what's happening here is that probably Perina was not um, not very literate. And uh, he has some somebody else, you know, as he says, uh, they're, uh, they had to uh, try they had to translate the treatise in uh, in Spanish, and it was corrected also. And even this little message here gets corrected afterwards. Uh, and this is this is an interesting point about friend about fencing masters in general, because we we tend to think of them as these highly educated people, you know, and uh, teaching the nobility and running in high circles of society. But th this is true of a tiny minority of fencing masters. Most fencing masters in history lived very poorly. And we know for a fact that many of them were illiterate, so they wouldn't even have been able to read most of the manuals we read today. And um, while some of them made a very good living, and some of them even got uh, Aristocratic titles later on. Uh, many of them actually toiled, and they uh, they had to accumulate jobs in order to survive. Uh, your common fencing master in Paris would uh, make about the same um, same salary as a bricklayer in the 18th century. It was not extremely bad, but uh, not not a great eater. And most of them would come from the working class, from the bourgeois class. Very few masters came from the aristocratic nobility of the time. So, you know, we we also have to consider that fencing was also something that was done by um, by the uh, the commoners at the time. So, in Pena system, you have uh, two main engaging guards. So the, the first one, I the first figure I showed you uh, was the, the first uh, engaging guard, it was uh, kind of a guard in Sagan. This is a guard in Thiers. Uh, so the first one, he says, we use it to teach beginners. It's easy to learn, you know, easy to uh, uh, protect yourself. But the guard in Thiers here, you, you teach uh, to more advanced students. This is the best one, more much more defensive, and you can use a thrust in, uh, in this guard. Uh, and can, uh, you can threaten your opponent with a thrust. And uh, this is in part why I would consider that Perina is probably more of the counterpoint than uh, Espadon guy, uh, although he doesn't talk too much about thrusting in his uh, short uh, manual. And another interesting point about him, you have there this floreo. So um, this is something, again, that we don't quite see a lot in French saber manuals published in France. Well, we see we see it in Lacan, and we see it in Baton, and we see it in other manuals published elsewhere that that are inspired by the French method. Uh, so this is a way to deal with multiple opponents, and it's very uh, similar. So you you know you you guys had a presentation on the Montante not too long ago, very similar to what of some of the big uh, bullion emotions you see in those uh, those styles. So lots of uh, very wide rotations with the saber, uh, very wide rotation of the body, the, the feet, even jumps. Um, so this is how to deal with multiple opponents when you're, you're encircled, uh, how to uh, get out of that situation. So there, there's these drills. And interestingly, they, they always have kind of a flower team around them, right? In French would be the rose couvert, covered rose. And uh, I've also seen um, uh, Italians uh, call it the, the um, uh, sorry, the um, rosette, for example. Uh, so, yeah, for, for some reason, that there's always this, this flower naming convention going on. And here is the first use of the term contrapoint, or here, contrapunta. And uh, Perina is showing us how to defeat a uh, band with a small sword. Uh, finally, the tables have turned, and we, we, now we're we're learning how to defeat the small sworder. And this is uh, basically how to counter the point. It seems to be where this idea comes from uh, for the term counterpoint. So, what is counterpoint? What are, so because Espadon and point were not already complicated enough, they had to introduce a third one. Uh, so, the first one to really um, Define a term is uh, Domenico Angelo. I think I need to uh, 
introduce the guy, but he, uh, in his um, manual, he copies a lot of things from Jira and uh, namely uh, some of his uh, stuff um, against Espedanars. And he tells us that, uh, so there, there's this new information that um, some Espedanar also like to use point. Uh, so they, they like to mix point with their cuts and they, they call it contrapoint. So it doesn't go in much further details, but this is really one of the first times we hear it in the French language. And the first manual of contrapoint, and we're, we're, we're jumping a few decades here, but uh, we'll go back in a minute to uh, the uh, Napoleonic era, don't worry. Uh, this is Valville, Alexandre Valville, published in 1817. Uh, so, uh, again, if you uh, have an interest in French labor, you might have heard the guy. Uh, so we don't know too much about Valville's life before he moved to Russia, uh, where he published in 1817 this, this uh, manual for the, uh, um, the Imperial Guard. Uh, and uh, this was published in only 200 uh, examples. So they're, they're pretty rare. Uh, so if you ever see one, uh, just uh, uh, grab it for me, please. Uh, but uh, so we know, though, that he was he was probably, uh, Valville was probably a product of the Ancien Regime, the old old uh, regime, because he refers to himself as a maître en fait d'armes, which is a very old-fashioned way to, uh, to refer to yourself. Like uh, in the 19th century, people start to drop the fait and they just call them maître d'armes. Or this um, so Velville started giving fencing lessons in St. Petersburg, sometimes in the 1810s. Uh, he acted as the fight choreographer for the Alexandrisky Theater. And in 1812, so right into the height of Franco-Russian hostilities, Velville was given the position of fencing master of the Imperial Lyceum at Tsarkoe Selo, where he taught twice a week until 1824. Uh, one of his students was uh, Alexander Pushkin. So, and in 1818, the Russian military created the position of general fencing master of the guard, which was given to Melville. And he reformed Russian military fencing, apparently, and his method really left an enduring mark in, uh, in the country. And he retired in 1840, went back to France. Now, Melville's manual is really interesting for many reasons. I won't go too, too much details about, about that, but uh, he uh, talks about contrapoint, of course, but he also, for some of the elements, uh, he's also interesting for some of his elements of Espadon, which he includes in his uh, manual, and namely quite a few colorful guards uh, that he never expands on, unfortunately. Uh, Belleville kind of likes to, to brag in his, his manual, and uh, I think this is kind of just to show how well educated is in other fencing traditions. Um, and one of them, which is probably, I, I think, one of the most misunderstood technique in all of his manual is uh, the garde déterminée, garde determine. So to me, it appears just uh, from reading the text, reading the description, it gives a simple bait, slip of the body, repost. That, that's pretty much it. But many people have seen a lot more in that one paragraph and that illustration. Um, so Valville does a lot of thrusting techniques in his method and possibly more than any other author. Unfortunately, that manual is beautiful, but it's not extremely uh, clearly written and can be a bit confusing at times. So I suggest if you have to, if you're really interested in, uh, in his method to start with Sokolov, who published his manual in 1843, but he was Valville's assistant to the Imperial Guard, and he published his own manual, and it's uh, it covers the basics extremely well. Uh, it's, it's direct to the point, right? Russian guy like doesn't go into uh, doesn't wax poetics about his fencing like uh, Valville will. Uh, so it, it's it's a very good beginner's guide. Unfortunately, it's only in Russian right now. But there's a translation coming up from Jeff Lord, and uh, so uh, keep uh, keep that in mind if you're if you're interested. But the illustrations as well are really good. You know, it shows us the beginning, the ending position, so there's very little confusion to be had about what he's uh, what he's telling you to do. And you can also look at Severbrook, which uh, was uh, probably also another 
uh, student or assistant to Belleville. We don't know quite much, but he uh, uh, published uh, a manual in the 1850s. This was translated in French in 1860. And it pretty much, uh, it's pretty similar to, to Belleville. Very, very short. You won't learn a lot of new stuff in there. But it's interesting to uh, to compare what he's uh, what he's presenting, and uh, showing also some training weapons. Always interesting. Also. And of course, we're going to Saint Martin. So uh, so we're going uh, back a little bit in time. Um, so while the star of Contrepoint is shooting up in the uh, First Empire days, that of the Espadon is really faltering, and we have uh, even writers like. Uh, Alexandre Muller in 1816 that tells us that the Espadon school has been mowed down by uh, the uh, imperial wars. There's no one left teaching that method. And now everybody teaches point on the point. So we, we don't know a lot either about the Saint-Martin, uh, other than he was a student of Denet, um, famous French master, and that Interestingly, he never formally learned Espadon from Dene, apparently, that, uh, from, his, uh, from his own words. But he observed it and uh, decided to create his own method based on his experience, uh, probably as a cavalry officer. Again, it's not quite clear what his, his experience is. Um, we know he has some sort of military service experience, and he was probably exiled to Australia uh, during the, uh, the revolution. So maybe he uh, got some some experience fighting with the Austrian military, maybe teaching fencing there. We, we don't really know. But his method is unique for the use of the car as the engaging guard instead of what you usually see Terce or Sagon. Uh, probably, I guess, Samartin was draw, drawing heavily from his uh, small source or background, you know, and, and where uh, the uh, the guard of uh, Kaft does a uh, it's a little bit more familiar to people who are uh, uh, doing point. So Espadon is dis disappearing from the scene in the 19th century. This is the only diploma I could find of a uh, Espadon master. This is uh, from 1832, if I remember right. Um, so uh, very interesting little diplomas. There's a lot of these uh, that were made. I can find them sometimes in auctions. Uh, they're uh, they're they're interesting because they uh, they came after the um, uh, the fall of the uh, Corporation des Maîtres d'Armes in 1791, and uh, from that point onward, uh, masters basically work mostly from their own reputation. There's no real controlling body anymore for fencing, uh, or no at least no uh, state officialized one, and so whenever you want to when you want to pass your exam, you have to do it in front of fencing masters. And you see all the different uh, signatures of the masters that were present to your examination at the bottom of the uh, uh, of the diplomas. And this is the contrapoint one. These ones you find quite a lot uh, in the 19th century. So the Napanek period is really interesting, is, is really an interesting one for Sabre. And uh, we start to see a few manuals and officers are now, are now more interested in Sabre than the foil, uh, in most cases at least. Uh, many people theorize that this was because of the Egyptian campaign. And while it probably boosted the interest in Sabre, I would say that it's uh, probably more the revolution that did that. Because remember, Saber is not quite what the noblemen or the, the bourgeois want to learn. This is uh, this is what the uh, the common soldier does, you know. And that there's this very strong culture, you know, at least push for this culture of the soldiery, in um, in the revolution in the empire, right? You have these these uh, simple soldiers uh, shooting right up to becoming generals. And so they're still carrying their sabers, and sabers become fashionable now. They become this thing that everybody wants to want, want to have, and everybody wants to 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 wield on the battlefield. And of course, uh, you know, we have the uh, uh, the sars and the uh, cuirassiers, of course, which are uh, uh, everybody's uh, role model at the time. 
So, and even Napoleon himself wearing sabers and, and portraits. So that, that definitely leaves a mark in people's imaginations. So how was saber fencing thought in the, uh, in the French military? That's also very interesting. So now you're, you're probably imagining rows of soldiers uh, like we see like in World War I or World War II, uh, just on a field, you know, and they're, they're, there's a drill surgeon and then and they're just barking uh, orders at them and they're just moving in unison. Um, forget that. That's uh, really not the reality, at least in the uh, Napoleonic era in France. Uh, fencing is taught on an individual basis. You want to learn fencing? Well, there's plenty of fencing masters in your regiment that are more than happy to teach you for a fee. Uh, because, uh, and I, this is uh, for them a way to uh, get uh, more money at the end of the month, right? And so there's uh, the, the officers of your regiment are kind of counting on these fencing masters to kind of boost their soldier skills. And uh, if, if an officer wanted to to teach fencing to his regiment, he could pay one of those fencing masters to, to do that, uh, but most wouldn't. And we have a few examples of them doing doing that, uh, uh, but uh, it's it's very rare. And even cavalry regiments, uh, you would have sometimes very basic instruction, and you would need to really uh, ask your your uh, your friends in the regiments to teach you or to seek a um, an actual uh, fencing master. And they were very um, uh, apparently from from what we read in soldiers' memoirs, those those fencing masters. Uh, were were really masters of uh, pressure selling. You know, they they would uh, they would come and see you, and they would uh, they would tell you, you know, hey, this guy hates your guts, and he wants to duel you. What you're gonna do? And um, they would uh, offer you fencing lessons, and uh, that's there was kind of this reputation also that fencing masters would uh, encourage dueling in the army, which was pretty much legal um, unless you you killed somebody but even then it was it was not that big of a deal i would say in the nepalic army and um the uh so 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 yeah there there's this image of the fencing masters as a uh, an enabler of the, the the evil dueling culture and uh, this is uh uh this is reflected in in some uh vaudeville plays even in, in the period um so I think I think this kind of um, uh, this kind of explains why we don't have a lot of manuals of saber in France at the time, because if you think about it, if you want to learn saber and you're not interested necessarily in foil, uh, you're uh, you're probably a military man because you're not going to be carrying a saber in your day to day life. Uh, if you're a gentleman, you're going to be carrying a small sword, at least in the 18th century. Uh, so, and if you join the military, there's plenty, there's there's tons of fencing masters and provost that are just uh, really willing to teach you. So if you really want to learn it, well, you go see one of them, and it's probably going to cost you less than uh, a book. So uh, I think this kind of explains it, uh, because there's so many masters around, there's no need for those those manuals really, and uh, this is uh, I think why in in other countries you see more manuals like in Britain for example, where uh, we have like Charles James tells us that uh, you know there there's uh, in France every regiment has plenty of fencing masters in Britain we don't really have that and I think this is why in Britain we have this push for uh, regulation methods and uh, also more and more bush, bush books been published uh, at the time because there is a demand and there is a need for it, uh, but not so much in France. But it, this is kind of ironic because there's this very strong culture of fencing in France, but we know very little about what they were teaching because they didn't publish, right? So publish or perish, I guess. So just to give you an idea, these are two diplomas that were made in uh, British prisons by uh, French prisoners during the uh, Napoleonic era. And um, <clears throat> so they're, they're both for point, 
Uh, they're very well, uh, very well done. But uh, at the bottom here, uh, you can see all the signatures from all the fencing masters who attended. Uh, so I haven't counted the one on the left, but the one on the right has more than 30 of them. And this is just for a cell block, you know. So the, it's it's incredible the the amount of, of, friend, of fencing master masters by square foot that you see in those prisons. So I guess people didn't have much to do, so they were they were learning fencing. Uh, but it gives you an idea of how just how many uh, how many fencing masters there were, and we have uh, a few. Uh, even a few American officers that ended up because of the, the War of 1812 ended up in those prisons and they would learn from those uh, French fencing masters. So not a lot is happening after the wars. There's uh, a few cavalry manuals uh, and uh, I won't touch too much about them uh, today because uh, that's a, I think that's a whole other world. Uh, but we have um, very little fencing on foot uh, as far as manuals go and uh, changes in 1847 you have uh, the then captain Edouard Bouet Willemez who's uh, going to be becoming a very famous admiral during the second empire but uh, he uh, uh, just uh, making sure this guy uh, uh, was uh, on board of a, an experimental ship in the 1840s uh, he was uh, also responsible for um, uh, the eradication of uh, slavery around the uh, North African coast. He would go on and uh, pursue uh, slaver ships uh, over there. And um, during his um, uh, his experience aboard his ship, he published a um, an article. And in this article, he explains to us he, uh, that he created this uh, fencing drill for his sailors. He says that uh, there's no standardized drills. You know, the officers, they're just uh, don't really care about teaching fencing to their, their men. They just you know, let them learn by themselves. He says that it'll, it would be good if we had this uh, these fencing drills like the British do and uh, to, uh, to just uh, uh, train all our men in fencing uh, to make sure they're, they're all trained the same way. And so he grabs all the uh, fencing masters aboard the ship and the uh, they start uh, drilling the man, and he publishes his method. And um, in 1851, uh, there's uh, the French government that publishes the first regulation method for sailors. Uh, and I think this is this is not exactly the same method as Guillaumez, but I think it, it was probably very heavily influenced by the the article he published and. Uh, People realize that yeah okay that there's probably a need for for that even though by this time cutlasses were realistically not that used uh, anymore but uh, uh, probably Bule, Bule Willemez had to use them uh, when he was pursuing um, uh, slaver ships in in North Africa. Now in 1851 there's also something else very important that happens in France. You have the creation of the Joinville. <clears throat> Uh, school, so the École Normale Militaire de Gymnastique et de Skim uh, in uh, <coughs> Joinville Le Bon. Sorry, just a sip of water. So, <clears throat> so uh, why is this very important? Because the uh, French government creates the schools really to uh, normalize the um, uh, the teaching of gymnastics and fencing to its troops. And this is uh, this is one of the first uh, big effort of this kind in France, but it is a massive one. You know, the, uh, the they bring a lot of students from all over to, to teach them, and they go back to their regiments and they teach their fellow soldiers, and uh, this becomes quite an example in uh, in the world actually. And uh, the the methods that were thought at Joinville influenced a lot of different countries. And in uh, 1875, there's uh, finally a method uh, that's published uh, for the uh, for the Joinville Academy uh, by the, uh, the the Minister of uh, the Colonies and um, the Navy. And uh, this is uh, this is a method that was uh, apparently panned by three different masters uh, from uh, the uh, uh, the Vincennes uh, garrison in uh, around Paris, 
and that they uh, this is this is the new method that's been introduced. And this method is going to be again very influential not only in France but all over the world because there's just so many so many fencing masters that are being produced there. It becomes like this factory of fencing masters that there's there's just not enough <laughs> not enough clientele for them to to teach once they're out of the military. So they uh, they just uh, they they start moving out uh, to uh, uh, I've I, I found them. Uh, in in the United States, I, I found uh, I, I don't even know how much to this point how many uh, Joinville fencing masters I found in, in newspaper ads uh, teaching in France. Uh, one of them that uh, we thought we could think about is uh, Louis Rondel, published a, a book in the 1880s. But you also have uh, them in uh, in Canada. I found them here in, in Quebec even uh, teaching uh, Savat teaching uh, Sabre, and uh, you have uh, even uh, as far as, uh, uh, even as far as South America, or as far as um, uh, as uh, Asia. Now, this is an interesting picture from the 1850s, and uh, this is from the uh, Imperial Guard de Sagal, the regiment of uh, Napoleon III, and uh, they're, they're practicing Sabre here with uh, their uh, wooden sabers and uh, so they have uh, uh, their, uh, their their padding equipment. You can see that their lead, lead leg is padded, uh, so they were allowing leg cuts. Um, not not exactly sure at this point when leg cuts started to be really banned in French fencing saber, but it seems to really only happen by the uh, uh, 1910s or even after World War One. It was it was definitely still a thing before that. And uh, why am I presenting them? Because uh, as I was talking, the, the French fencing masters have quite an influence. And I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's really interesting to look at them and uh, to understand what their influence has been. Because like I was saying, they're, they didn't publish much, but they were everywhere. And we tend in HEMA to only look at the manuals. And I think that's unfortunate because we get a, a skewed perspective from from just looking at these these manuals of what uh, what the fencing culture and the fencing world was like, and uh, the uh, if you look at it, the United States, for example, uh, first master at uh, West Point was French, and that most of the masters during the 19th century were also French. Uh, at uh, Annapolis, you have uh, Antoine Corbusier, he's a Belgian guy, but uh, Corbusier taught at the Saint Gaud. Long. Uh, he was uh, uh, probably a student of uh, Augustin Grisi, who was uh, teaching the uh, Imperial Guard there. And uh, you, have, you have many, many others uh, fencing uh, masters, I was saying, in, in, in the States and many other places as well. And one really interesting place where French saber fencing spread out uh, and was influential is in Japan. Uh, so in the uh, 18th 60s and up to the 1880s, the uh, the French sent military missions to uh, to France, uh, sorry to to Japan, and uh, because the Japan was looking to modernize its army, and the French army was the the largest uh, one of the most developed uh, land armies in the world, and uh, so they they called to uh, to the French to establish uh, military academies and uh, namely to copy the Joinville Academy became the Toyama Academy. Uh, and this is one of the first manuals they published, which is basically a translation of the uh, 1877 fencing manual. Uh, so if we were to uh, redo the, the Last Samurai today, uh, I think we, we'd have to uh, replace Tom Cruise by uh, maybe Jean Dujardin or some other, uh, some other, guy, other French pretty boy. Uh, talking about... Uh, French um, instructor. So the, uh, the, the uh, person right at the bottom, center row, uh, here is uh, David Aré. So he was uh, one of the instructors in Japan. And these are some of these his students. Uh, so he was uh, teaching many things, uh, including uh, fencing. And uh, along with, uh, I think, uh, can't exactly remember the uh, the name of his, uh, the other instructor, but uh, they both joined a Kenjutsu dojo as well in Japan under uh, 
uh, Sakagi Ibarra Kenkichi. And uh, I think that's uh, that's very interesting uh, that uh, even though they were going to Japan, they were uh, to teach them uh, French fencing, they still had enough interest in in uh, local uh, martial arts to uh, to join up a, uh, an actual dojo and learn it. So we don't have really a lot of details about how that that went about, but uh, I, I always like to 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 read about these uh, uh, these exchanges that that happened. So uh, by the 1870s up to World War One, there's really a surge of interest in fencing in the Western world, um, mostly because France is uh, is pushing uh, fencing very curiously after the uh, Franco-Prussian War, uh, after that big defeat. Uh, French is pushing this kind of revenge spirit with its population, an hyper-militaristic uh, spirit as well. And they see fencing uh, as one key component of this, uh, for good or worse, because uh, if you're interested in, uh, if you have some interest in the Franco-Prussian War, you uh, probably know that fencing was not that much useful in, in that war, but uh, still some people had strong opinions about this and the uh, about how the, the French um, excuse me the impre- the the expression but the, the, the French race uh, was uh, would have been called back then uh, was uh, you know there was a, that they had this very uh, sanguine character and they, they would just uh, they would they, their uh, they would use their elan and their their courage you know to to vanquish the enemy uh, add on with their their bayonets and their swords. Of course, we know by World War One that uh, it uh, wasn't the, the the brightest of ideas, but it was uh, this uh, philosophy that was that was pushing it. And after World War One, there's a gradual decline in in fencing in France. By the 1920s, situation is quite dire, and uh, there's uh, there there starts to be quite a lot of uh, changes in uh, in the fencing world, and which leads us to uh, later on to the uh, Olympic fencing format and all the uh, evolutions that, that we know that happen after this. So this is the end for this uh, slide presentation, at least. Uh, so I just want to tell you, uh, thank you for taking the time to to listen. And uh, if you have any questions, I, I also brought some uh, because I, I, I also collect uh, antique swords and uh, got quite a few here. And if you uh, uh, if you want, I can do a quick show and tell. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Do we have questions for Max? I have a question. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Uh, first, thank you for the uh, presentation. Uh, it was wonderful. Uh, second, um, have you? read Ivanovsky and if so what were your impressions of it uh yeah so Ivanovsky um Polish uh officer for the uh the Imperial Guard Napoleon uh so yeah he published this this uh manual in uh, 1834 uh yeah that it's it's an interesting manual so it's a, it's centered around cavalry uh, as I said, I, it's not a subject I wanted to to broach too much during this presentation, but I, I can do a quick quick blurb about it. So there is a in France, there's uh, there's a big divide between fencing on foot and fencing on a horse, and and there's even one author that tells us these two things they're like they're like two languages. You can find commonalities in both, but in the end, they're they're quite different. And uh, I think that that makes a lot of sense. And this definitely is um, it's definitely something that characterizes uh, Ivanovsky. I think it's really a cavalry saber treatise. And you know, I've seen people and uh, sometimes try to use it as uh, maybe a guide for uh, some other um, you know so, so some other hidden. Uh, saber fencing method on foot it, it's really not what it is it's uh it's it's definitely meant for horse where you don't necessarily have to always cover yourself with the guard you can use wider sweeping cuts of course because you're cutting at people below you uh, 
Uh, there's, you know, you're in a galloping horse. Uh, things are extremely different. Uh, so, you know, that that's what I would say about Ivanovsky. Unfortunately, I, I don't do cavalry saber. I don't have a horse. Uh, live in a tiny apartment would be uh, would be hard to keep a horse here. But uh, no, but more seriously, uh, it's it's something I'd I'd, I'd be definitely uh, interested in trying a few times. Uh, but um, yeah, it, it it's it's definitely a great resource to understand uh, early nineteenth century cavalry fencing in France. I don't know how much it relates to his Polish background. Um, I found very little sources telling us about uh, Polish people teaching fencing in France. The Really the big guys in Cavalry Sabre at the time were the Austrians and the Prussians. And this is uh, this is what Muller is following in his method is is basically copying the the Austrian methods and Zofau is also just translating those those same methods, and he um, the Muller even uh, sues Zofau because he says he's, he's copied me, and Zofau says no, you copied the Austrians and I just translated what they wrote. Uh, so yeah, the the I'd say the the Austrians and the the um, Russians are, are really the, the big guys, and they, uh, I think, they probably influence what Ivanovsky was was showing as well. Uh, so anyway, I, I I hope that kind of answered your your question. Oh, it it, okay. it definitely does. I uh, I was thinking about it, and uh, if you know, worth diving into uh, with some friends that speak the language. But uh, if it's mostly cavalry centered, then it's it's not really what I'm looking for. So I very much appreciate that answer. No problem. Yeah, very interesting. Again. Uh, if you if you want to understand the difference between the two, I think it's it's worth uh, it's worth looking at. Uh, also, Muller, uh, but yeah, that's cavalry saber. So I would have a question. Oh, sorry. Go, go ahead and get the next question. Yeah, uh, I would have a question. So uh, first of all, Maxim, thank you for your presentation as always. And uh, I wanted to know. Uh, what, in your opinion, should be done to promote? It's kind of a meta question, but what, in your opinion, should be done to promote uh, French saber in the overall modern HEMA military saber community? Because most right. sources studies today are British and German, I guess, and mm -hmm. not so much French. Yeah. Hmm. Well, yeah. Thanks for your question on me uh that that's really uh yeah, it's really a difficult topic to uh to answer i think that uh i think first off we need to do more translations and make them more accessible uh because that's a big problem right now there's a lack of translations uh and you know whether we want it or not the hema world is very it's very anglophone and if things are not translated into English, then they stay in their little niche corner. We need to do that. We need to do, we need videos of interpretations. We need people publishing interpretation and in books, you know, and uh, uh, yeah. And, you know, I, I think that that's what's needed. But also I, you know, I, I consider that a lot of the fencing uh, that's happening in the 19th century it's very similar to what French fencing is. And I, I think that even if people study British or any other uh, tradition of, of saber or broadsword, it's it's perfectly fine. And it's very easy once, if you have a good grasp of that to then branch off into some other manuals. Uh, I think it's, uh, I think that the general message, the general idea I'm getting at here is that uh, I don't think we should just corner our, ourselves and just one little national view of fencing because that's not what people were doing back then you know uh again i always take the example of angelo publishes method uh on a strong scottish fencing learned fencing in paris um and from british uh, also, as, as, or Scottish masters, from what I understand, uh, we tend to focus on that little part. 
but it's it's you know angelo is a it's a it's the, the whole picture of european fencing at the time it's all these different influences very very heavy french background because uh french fencing at the time is not just uh the steam rolled over europe so everything kind of looks french um but uh yeah it's it's important to look at other things and I, I would encourage people to look at french sources as much as to look at italian sources or german sources and i, and I hope there's more and more translation more and more curiosity on all these these different uh, uh manuals and traditions um yeah so yeah, uh inputs, yep yes you got me. we have a question in the chat uh, max uh, by baptiste Okay, yeah, so question about the reluctance of nobles to be seen learning fencing could have also been due to their attachment to never stopping to any, uh, stooping to any form of labor as they would perceive themselves above that. Uh, like the idea of being born nobles and being gifted nobility of status as well as Mara by God. But I do also think of them as being proud of being unemployed, lazy, F words. Pardon my French, uh, no problem. <laughs> uh, so yeah, but just uh, yeah, good point. Uh, yeah, I you know, there, there's there's difference between what they're saying and the what they're the, what they're saying about their reasons and what their reasons really are, right? And we can you know we we can definitely uh, analyze that uh, further on. Uh, so yeah, they're saying, oh, you should not be seen in fencing classes because uh, that that's vulgar and uh, the process of noblemen should not be seen. But yeah, on the, on the other side, there's also this uh, this this culture of uh, if you're working, if you're training, if you're if you're doing, if, if you're sweating and all this, uh, like that's not your place as a, as a nobleman. And if um, if you know Malière, uh, the Bourgeois uh, Gentilhomme, very famous play that uh, from the 17th century. Uh, there's a very famous scene with a uh, bunch of um, uh, masters that are teaching this this bourgeois, and um, and it's it's basically a comedic play. And there's the fencing masters, the fencing master that enters, and he's trying to teach this this bourgeois man fencing, and he just buffoons around, you know, and the, the bourgeois is just uh, helpless and you can sense in there that the message is you know you, you bourgeois you can try and learn fencing as much you know you can pay for your lessons but you'll never be you'll never be as good as we are naturally you know and uh like like, like look at him just going around there and trying to uh, exert himself uh, lessons and all this but and yeah i think this is this is uh it's probably a, a good point that yeah they're uh there, there's just this whole culture of nobility and this uh, this idea of nobility that uh, doesn't necessarily like uh, the fact uh, that they they have to work and that uh, they they they're not naturally good at, at everything. Thanks a lot for your answer. That's uh, that, that's funny you mentioned the uh, Google Social team. That's that exact scene I was thinking about. So, yeah, thanks. Thanks for the answer. Next question for Max. Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, Go ahead. Yeah, uh, so you mentioned, uh, I guess the Meiji period is when the, the, the Japanese started having uh, the French masters come over. Is that around the same time their uh, bayonet tradition came in? Because I know along with Kendo and stuff like that, they have their own sort of uh, weird thing with bayonet, weirdly enough. So let me just let me just grab something here. This is one of the uh, manuals that was published in Japan. Uh, so this is a later one. Uh, people here might have seen it, but it's a, it's a very interesting little booklet. Um, and yeah, there's the bayonet there and uh well that, that's actually an interesting page because uh so at first the japanese they come up and they uh, 
they they learn the French uh, bayonet method, and that, that there's also a whole other talk to be had on this. And I encourage you to, uh, if if you can read French, to pick up some books by Julien Guéry, who's done a lot of research on this. Uh, but the, the French were really again influential in bayonet fencing, and of course they they fought in Japan. Um, for many different reasons, the Japanese uh, came to reject a lot of the French fencing principles, and um, they, they they completely rejected foil fencing. They saw it as a waste of time, and bayonet fencing they also modified. And from what they uh, they wrote down, one of the reason was that uh, they they their soldiers were finding it too difficult. To, uh, to do the lancé, the coup lancé, which is uh, kind of a, I guess it's the, uh, um, it's a it's a basic technique in French bayonet fencing where you release the left hand and you you trust directly with with your bayonet to gain some some reach, um, and yeah, doing that with one of those heavy rifles is is quite a challenge. Uh, so they they started to turn their backs. On it, and uh, they said that oh, you know, we were we're going back to these uh, these Japanese methods. But there's uh, there's this researcher that's based in Japan and who actually does uh, jukendo, so the bayonet, modern bayonet fencing, and he uh, he it's a uh, Betis Tavernier, and I uh, also recommend if you can find his articles online to to read them. It's really interesting because while they say that they've they've let go of French bayonet fencing, and it just adopted traditional Japanese spear and all this. It's very evident from their methods that there's still a very uh, strong uh, French background to all this. And uh, even you can see it in the page I open here, where they they still divide the body in uh, the four uh, quarters you would see in uh, um, in French foil fencing or bayonet fencing. And uh, so, yeah, there, there, there was this uh, this strong influence, and some people even say that karate has a strong French um, influence in how it organizes its katas. And I think that's it's an interesting idea, but I don't know much about it. But uh, some uh, university professors have uh, apparently done done a lot of research, and they're supposed to be publishing something about this. So I'm, I'm eager to see what will come out of it. Thank you. That was way more informative than I thought, thought I would get in of an answer. Like, you covered quite a lot with that. So, thank you very much. No problem. My pleasure. I think uh, next question we have in the chat by Francois. So, Francois questioned the fact that fencing training is changing in the 18th century to individual training instead of academic training. Could it come from the fact that the sword is less prevalent in the battlefield, leaving it? Place uh, it's placed to the pike and shot battle style. Ah, very, very yeah, very interesting question. So, uh, I think maybe the yeah the point I was making might have been misunderstood. So that there wasn't necessarily a change from uh, individual training um, instead of uh, I guess you're 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 saying like group training or something like this or like uh, like um, let's see like. Uh, the universal training uh, from all the sources I've looked at I've, I've never seen a much mention of people being trained in swordsmanship when they joined the army uh, even if it's the Renaissance era or the um, even the medieval era I like I've yet to find traces of people saying that they were you know you join the army and they drill you for a week in swordsmanship and then okay you know, now you go. That's a. That is, I think it's a very modern view on military training, um, and we tr we kind of we think about this and we say, well, that's that's logic, right? You join the army, they show you how to shoot a gun and uh, uh, you know punch people or uh, you know do push-ups and march around, and uh, that's uh, yeah, that that makes sense. Uh, why wouldn't anybody do this? But I feel like this this idea that you know you you wanted to learn fencing 
well, either you should have done this before joining, or you know, you can ask the people around you to do this, or you can ask one of those fencing masters, and you have plenty around, and they'll show you. But uh, you know, that's not my obligation as an officer to to make sure you learn that. I have I have much more important things to worry about, and even the I think even the um, the manuals you see on pike drills and all this, they're much more concerned about um, making sure that the soldiers know which position to take at which time. You know, oh, cavalry form, cavalry square. Okay, get in this position. Okay, we're marching, get in this position. But there's not a lot of, here's how you parry a truss to the outside. Here's how you parry a truss to the inside and, you know, grab this, this pike or uh, get your sword and parry like this. So um, I, I Again, I'd, I'd be interested to find if there's any source that shows us like group training before uh, the 19th century, but I again, I've yet to see a lot of it. Thank you. I think next question in the chat uh, by Dai. I right, so I Andrews, what? French sources would you recommend to study to better understand the influence of French fencing on American fencing prior to 1870? Hmm. Good question. Um, well, I guess it depends on which period exactly. Um, I would say, you know, if, if you're interested in probably revolution era, stuff like that, definitely. Angelo and uh, probably Dene as well. If you're if you're willing to subject yourself to, to that kind of uh, an ordeal, uh, but um, they they would probably give you a, a good idea of what was kind of fashionable fencing at the time. Um, and if you if you go a little bit further, probably La Boissière, um, and then for saber fencing, that's a little bit more tricky. I do think that in the early years of the uh, of, uh, the United States, it, there was still a very strong basis in British fencing, and we see it quite a lot. Um, and that, that, I don't think we should uh, discard this at all. Uh, but I, there's, there's also French fencing masters coming and teaching as well. Uh, so I would look at probably uh, at Valville, if you're interested in, in the Sabre, or at uh, Perina, even, maybe, uh, because I think they still reflect what would have been done a little bit earlier or a little bit later. And um, yeah, I think that, that's what I would say. But yeah, it's a, it's a good question. It, it's, a, it, it's a world that evolves. Uh, I think you also need to to learn uh, to uh, to look at older methods as well, because uh, when we look at what people are reading in different eras, they always go back long way. You know, people are will still be reading Angelo in the mid nineteenth century, and uh, you know there there would still be some some influence from these these earlier authors. Uh, so it's not quite as I don't that's. Ten years uh, too late. I that it's not relevant anymore, right? That doesn't change that that fast. I think there's still different different schools and different views on fencing. I hope that answers your question. Good. We're getting close to the uh, close of the the second hour. So if there's any other questions for for Max. Um, I'll, get, I'll let you guys ruminate on that and I'll kind of ask a question for Max. <laughs> so as we've kind of talked before, Max, I'm, I'm very interested in sort of the historical origins as sort of my tradition of the sort of the Northern mixed school, right? That mixes the French and the Italian. And the conventional narrative we have of this is that, you know, it's these Italian fencing masters that in part of the Napoleonic Wars trained in the sort of French military system mustered out and then start fencing schools in the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s. Uh, and I, I, and I, I, do, I do think that's a big part of it. But part of me also wonders when we look, you mentioned Angelo and Angelo's very cosmopolitan sort of background. 
or we think even of Raymond, who was teaching in Piedmont and, and things like that. Is it possible to look at, as you mentioned earlier, not just having this is British fencing, this is French fencing, but really thinking about how cosmopolitan sort of elites, perhaps, and maybe even fencing masters were in the 18th century? Is that maybe a better way to look at it rather than trying to always source things back to hyper-nationalism in the French Revolution? Kind of as an open-ended question, it's probably not very precise. But <laughs> um yeah um so well as far as um as far as Italy is concerned it's not it's not a world that i i'm extremely uh knowledgeable in and i'm i'm afraid i i you know you probably know more about this uh, this part of the fencing world than i do uh i've all i'm also of the impression that there's there was a very big french influence on in italy at um and during the napoleonic era uh namely because some of those authors tell us that they've been part of the great army or the uh you know they say oh this is the like the, the or uh, this is the, the french style of fencing or also because they include elements that are typically french in their um their teaching like uh, baton bastone which i think has a very uh big uh uh, French background to it, um, or um, how to deal with multiple opponents, like the Rose Couverte. Uh, so I think there's that, uh, but I think there's uh, there's definitely some uh, uh, some styles that evolve on their own. And uh, you know, I'd I'd be hard pressed to say what influence what. Uh, we know from Belleville, for example, that he um, I think Belleville has some Italian stuff in his method as well you know he tells us that he studied the uh napoleon napoleon napolitan um uh fencing school and uh, you know he presents this this low guard which grisier later on when he does his uh, skating critic of Belleville, tells us that oh this is this guard you know uh, this is the uh uh, this is the, the Italian guard, and the, when he does the half half vault, he calls it the uh, uh, I'd say the the ruse Italian, the Italian ruse, uh, the Italian trick. Um, so yeah, I think that you know Belleville apparently traveled all over Europe to learn from different masters, and it seemed like it was a common thing back in the day as well, especially in the 18th century, kind of like what noblemen would do with their and you know they would go around Europe and I think that a lot of fencing masters when they were provo they would would leave and they would go on this pilgrimage around Europe and see different masters and learn what was done elsewhere before going back to Paris um so yeah I guess yeah, I would say like definitely we have to we have to to look large and not just yeah again be or is, is stuck in our little corner of uh, of the world because it's easy in in saber and a 19th century 18th century fencing to just focus on the tiny part of it because there's just so many sources and you can't quite do that in the renaissance, the renaissance or medieval era uh, where you're kind of forced to look at a single source but we have the chance to, to have such a rich and diverse array of sources i think we should definitely look um at, at, at as many of at them as possible thank you max no problem any any last minute questions for max we'll give it I, guess I, I can show a little bit a few interesting things i have here if you're oh yes go ahead please max um so the first thing i wanted to show there's this um so this is a um an actual training saber from Joinville, uh, it's a wooden training saber. Uh, so you see those in catalogs, you see them in uh, so photographs of soldiers training. This one has no handguard. Um, looks a little bit like uh, Shashka, like a uh, Kozak uh, saber, but some of them do have uh, steel hilts on them. And uh, we know the weights are usually around three to 500 grams, if I remember right. This one is especially light without uh, the guard, I guess. It's around uh, 180 grams. 
it's it's like uh it's like a foil uh, and i think a lot of it is due to the fact that it was well used and they, they had to shave down the, the blade quite a lot for training and uh french some some french fencing authors like uh, Romuald Brunet, for example, they tell us that you should start beginners with wooden swords, these, these light wooden swords at first, because that way they learn proper uh, proper movement, proper techniques, you know, and they, uh, then you can switch them to the, uh, the steel sabers. Uh, so, uh, but you, you, see, you see a lot of those, and I, I, I was very lucky to uh, be able to, to buy this from... Uh, uh, Maître Gérard Six, as a, a, a French uh, fencing historian, uh, was uh, selling off a few, uh, a few of his, uh, his, uh, his stuff. Um, but I, I've got other, other things in here. So, you know, when we're talking about early saber fencing, so this is an, we usually call it an épée de soldat. This is um, a sword that was carried by French soldiers from uh, 16, uh, 1680, I think. Not sure anymore. Anyway, but the, this is this is one of the first patterns, first military patterns ever made, and certainly one of the first to use uh, bronze or brass in the hilt. Uh, and this is a uh, cut and truss sword. It was carried all the way to 1763 by uh, French fusiliers or line infantrymen. Um, and uh, was very heavily criticized at the end because people are saying that uh, you know, soldiers are mostly using it now to uh, uh, as walking aids or as uh, to uh, roast some sausages on the fire. So should we really have soldiers carry swords anymore? So that was a big question. Uh, but this is uh, a very important piece of uh, fencing, uh, military fencing history, I guess. And this one here, this is a Napolnik light infantry officer saber. Uh, so these the, these are sometimes called 1800 types. We're not exactly sure when they, they appear, but it's around 1800, around the uh, consular era. And uh, this is uh, this is a pretty short saber, but this is this is meant really for uh, the, these were carried mostly by light infantry or by um, uh, grenadier regiments. They were the ones really using sabers, while line infantry would still be carrying the sword. Till 1821, when this pattern was introduced. This is the 1821 infantry officer saber. Uh, so now every every uh, every corps is uh, pretty much um, wearing this one, and this this very interesting piece uh, because it has an inscription on it. And I don't know if you're going to be really able to see it, uh, maybe not. Uh, but it, on one side, it says, Sauve mon sabre, save my saber. And on the other side, yeah, probably not very visible. This says, uh, so last words from uh, Mr. Dupuis, uh, captain, captain of Grenadiers at the 20th of line killed at the passage of the Atlas. Uh, so this is a, uh, during, during the uh, invasion of Algeria, uh, I actually found a mention of this captain uh, dying uh, when they were evacuating um, a city in, in Algeria. Uh, he was, uh, he was uh, shot in the uh, Atlas Passage, which is a mountain pass in, uh, in Algeria. Um, and uh, he, his last words were to save his saber, uh, and uh, I feel quite uh, quite special to uh, that the sab saber kind of landed in my my hands now. Uh, probably gonna donate it to a French museum at some point so they can interpret it um, in, in, in the right way. Uh, and I guess I'm gonna show you this last one. So around the uh, Algerian invasion as well, French soldiers uh, started, uh, uh, at least those that were serving in North Africa, started to wear these, uh, what we call now North African troops sabers. Uh, and they're straight. This one is for a superior officer. So it has the um, 
regulation blade, a long straight blade meant to be used both on foot and on a horse. And, but it has this um, steel guard to it, which is uh, made in a, kind of a neo-Gothic style. And uh, these were non-regulation. They were called fantasy uh, in France. And, but they were very popular with North African officers. And uh, we believe that it's probably because they had to face more, um, uh, more soldiers or more enemies in uh, in North Africa that were still using swords, and so they they came up with these steel hilted swords with long thrusting blades, so they could use their crusts against opponents who were not necessarily always quite as familiar with uh, at least uh, French uh, point fencing. Um, so that's I, that's one theory. So yeah, the, these. Uh, these swords became regulation in 1882, and they were carried right up until 1916. And uh, if you're wondering, uh, they were carried in uh, World War One in the first few years, uh, but people pretty quickly realized that this wasn't going to be a uh, yeah, it wasn't going to be a Napoleonic War or anything like that. So uh, they they got. Um, uh, they got completely removed from officers' um, uh, field kits in 1916. So that's it for my little show and tell. I've got more, but I don't want to spend the other hour talking about all of them. I, I, if, you, if you've never uh, uh, visited, I highly recommend Max's website, I Sell Swords. Uh, lots of wonderful pictures and history of a lot of the pieces that he has. Uh, I think I see Francois has one more question in the chat, Max. All right. Uh, so, Francois, well, I'm doing research mostly in the early 17th century during the Thirty Years' War. It's also the rising period for the rapier and the mousquet. From what I have found, the rapier is mostly a civilian sword versus what the military will be using, but they rarely name the sword. From what you have mentioned, uh, they would be using saber as a straight blade sword or would it have another name um I, I, yeah i think saber would probably have been a name that people would have been using in the late 17th century to talk about their swords um and uh i'll talk about rapiers and have this uh saxon rapier early 1600s. Um, so they um, uh, they would have uh, probably used them more like, uh, I guess, um, Saint Didier does. Uh, this is a riding sword. This is a sword for using on, on a horse. Uh, but this is pretty much what people would call a rapier. And um, the thing is, uh, I think it's very hard to define what exactly is what at that time. People were not quite as strong or as uh they were not as preoccupied by strict definition as we are today right so a, a sword and a pay could be it could be anything a rapier could be anything you wanted to call a rapier um so it's yeah it's hard to say that people would have called this that and that other thing this it yeah uh, it's pretty hard, but you know, and I also think that when we try to make the distinction between rapier, civilian, and military, again, I'm I'm not so sure. I think this is kind of a this is kind of a modern thing again. Um, we see a lot of rapiers represented in um, in illustrations of um, of soldiers at the time. You know, even small swords were carried uh, as uh, regulation uh, in the 18th century. And uh, so, yeah, what is what is a military sword? What is a civilian sword? I think it's a, uh, I think people probably, probably asked themselves a question too back in the day, but I don't think that they were quite as, yeah, quite as uh, fixated on it. And, and and remember as well that 
even if you're in the military, dueling is still a concern, especially in the French military, right? Because when you when you join as a soldier, an officer, you're probably going to get tested uh, through a duel, and uh, you might get provoked in a duel by uh, uh, an officer from uh, another uh, from the enemy um, lines at some point, and you know your 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 men are going to be looking up to you to rise up to the challenge. Uh, and if you're not, if you're refusing, then it's going to be bad uh, for you and be bad for the morale. And we have we have actually documented um, duels happening in the middle of a battlefield. You know, people riding to the other side and say, hey, I want to duel you. Uh, and uh, that would happen. Uh, so, yeah, dueling uh, and I think fencing uh, in the army was not just about line battles, you know, if you're an officer and carrying a sword and you go to the front line with your swords, you're a lousy officer, you know, you should be behind, you should be directing your men, helping them, you should be in front where you're, you have no idea what's going on. And um, so, yeah, so your sword is going to be, it's not going to be like your, your front, um, yeah, your, your main weapon, it's going to be and have many other uses that we don't necessarily associate today with wartime. I guess that, that's what I'm trying to say. All right. Uh, any last minute questions for Max? <laughs> just as a, on the point about the rapier and saber, I, I just put a little link on uh, Marcelli's section about using a rapier and defending against an enemy with a saber. Probably the first time we kind of see that late 17th century. Kind of just kind of dovetail on some of the things that Max said. <laughs> so, <clears throat> all right. Any other last minute questions? All right. Well, I will, if you could please join me and uh, saying uh, thank you or merci uh, to Max for sharing all sorts of research and swords, even better, uh, with us today as part of the as part of the video. And again, to raise awareness of uh, the French fencing tradition and French saber as well. Um, so thank you very much, Maxime. <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, thank you, everyone, for attending uh, and uh, for sticking around. Uh, if you ever have any other questions, if you're uh, interested in learning more, you know, in, as uh, Patrick was saying, check my blog or just contact me on uh, Facebook or uh, email or whatever you like. And uh, yeah, I'll be happy to uh, discuss further. Yeah. And Max is just a wealth of information. He's And he's amazingly patient when I ask him questions on Facebook. So it's always quite nice. Um, just as an admin note, so I will try to, I try to have about one or two of these every month. Um, so if you liked what you had today, you know, like the Facebook page for Sala de los uh, or on Instagram, and I'll try to come up with other um, lectures. Been talking with Maestro Francesca Loda to talk about Marcelli Rapier, um, maybe Jacopo Penso talking about Marazzo, and we've got a couple other topics. Um, uh, Kevin Marcoshi on tempo. So we'll try to have a, one or two of these a month if you found this of interest. Uh, and also if you found that um, we didn't have enough time with any of our guests, um, we, we, I can always ask for people to come back. So maybe next time we can have Max talk about cavalry or <laughs> cavalry savers or French stick fighting and all, all sorts. I know Kate's there, so she'd be interested in French, French cavalry. So um, always just let me know. Um, just drop me a line and let me know the things that you guys are all interested in. I'd like to try and get people out there and get access to more interaction. All right, well, thank you all very much. Have a good day. Merci beaucoup. Merci, au revoir. <laughs>